This is Revolution at Sea with John Curtis Perry. Episode 27, New Dimensions of Warfare. Shifting economic patterns within the European North Atlantic core provide new strategic balances, opportunities for new leadership, a new competitive edge, and the rise of a multi-power system. The new competition is expressed in an armaments race, most spectacularly navalism, as we have seen, and in competing alliance systems. These were fragile because of a lack of underlying principle. Russia and France being a prime example, an absolute monarchy linked to a republic. When Tsar Alexander III stood at attention while a band played the French revolutionary hymn, the Marseillaise, who knows what disgust he may have been smothering. Nationalism galvanized a neurotic climate of suspicion and insecurity out of which World War I erupted. A prosperous continent at the height of its success as a source and agent of global wealth and power, and at one of the peaks of its intellectual and cultural achievement, would be transformed by war, thrust into what the English poet Siegfried Sassoon called the Grey Land of Death. World War I would drag its shadow through literature, music, and the visual arts. World War II would leave its own legacies of bitterness and horror. The Atlantic world, notably Europe, would reach the end of its long period of preeminence and power in global affairs. During this period, 1914-1945, European primacy reached its peak in 1914. At least, the Europe identified as a group of competing nation-states. Then came two great civil wars. In August 1914, World War I began with Europe globally preeminent. In 1945, World War II ended with an exhausted and devastated continent, slipping into the periphery of global affairs. Sir Isaiah Berlin, speaking from a European perspective, called it the worst century there has been. The Second War and its aftermath saw 85 new sovereign states spring from European colonial empires, especially British and French, primarily in Afro-Eurasia and the Caribbean. The great Atlantic Oceanic empires, those political products of the First and Second Oceanic Revolutions, died. Historian Neil Ferguson argues that in the 20th century the costs of fighting its imperial rivals, Germany twice, the Japanese and Italians once, destroyed the British Empire. But this rather Eurocentric, Anglocentric view ignores the readiness of Afro-Eurasia to throw off the European yoke 
They needed only the faltering of their imperial masters. Japan had already shown that mastery of the machine was not an Atlantic monopoly, and the machinery and mentality of modernization were spreading to many parts of the world. These phenomena encouraged ambitions for independence, political, economic, and cultural. The 20th century was immensely destructive for Europe, with the world ocean functioning as a great arena for conflict. But for most Americans, both wars were elsewhere. Americans suffered inconvenience, but not austerity. Their standards of living did not fall, they rose. We had no feeling that the country was at risk of survival. Elsewhere, 20th century total war affected civilians as the home front becomes a true front for violence. But Americans went through a charade of preparation for something that never happened. As a 14-year-old plane spotter in Arlington, Virginia, through my binoculars I looked in vain for German bombers to appear over Washington, D.C., but in Eurasia, attack was vicious reality, and ordinary people suffered privation due to disruption of traditional trade routes and life-threatening combat. Assault came from the air as well as from the ground, both for vanquished and victors. Sea warfare becomes three-dimensional, surface, subsurface, and aerial. Surface was, of course, traditionally significant. As for the two new dimensions, subsurface was significant in both world wars. Aerial warfare was primitive in World War I, significant in World War II. In both of these two great wars, combat at sea was of vast importance in determining the victor. Both conflicts demonstrated the vulnerability of each side to losing command of the sea. Britain's true lifeline lay across the Atlantic, as I said earlier, more important than routes to Asia. It demonstrated that a powerful navy was essential because survival depended upon protecting ships bringing in essential imports. These put Argentine beef and Canadian wheat on British tables, not to mention their role as conduit for flows of vitally important fuel, weapons, and troops from the U.S. In World War I, the Royal Navy battle fleet performance was disappointing. It was unable to crush the German high seas fleet, which had better ships, better gunnery, and used radio, whereas the British were still using semaphore which was hard to read at any distance. A stalemate between the two great battleship fleets made for mutual deterrence. The Germans were wary because of their numerical inferiority. The British hesitated because they already controlled the world ocean and wanted to continue to do so. A battle could jeopardize that command. When the two navies did meet at Jutland in 1916, the result was a draw, but the German high seas fleet did not sortie again. We can question the value of the huge investment both sides had made in capital ships. Smaller units would prove more useful. Is this perhaps a lesson for today? German raiders were able to sink Allied merchant ships on the world ocean, but the battle fleet was effectively bottled up and the raiders were gradually hunted down and destroyed. The Royal Navy successfully halted and destroyed German shipping everywhere outside of the Baltic and imposed a blockade which caused the Germans to suffer. By commanding the seas, the British could cut off markets and sources, preventing enemy opportunities to buy or to sell.
the British could exploit ruthlessly their global position in insurance, fuel bunkering, and repair, to manipulate the neutrals and to destroy German international trade. Warfare moved into new dimensions. The submarine would transform war at sea, but the lesson was slow to be absorbed. As late as 1902, one British admiral denounced it as underhand, unfair, and damned un-English. But Britain began the war with 55 subs, more than any others except France. The Germans started with only two dozen short-range submarines, not intended for the broad Atlantic. Early in the morning of September 22nd, 1914, in the North Sea, 18 miles off the Hook of Holland, an event occurred that would send the naval world a sharp message of the power of this new weapon. A U-boat scored the first and single greatest German submarine victory of the war. In less than one hour, U-boat 9 torpedoed and sank three British cruisers lacking protective escorts. Almost 1,500 British sailors perished. Few Germans or anyone else had realized that the submarine would be their most potent naval weapon. But even Tirpitz would soon reluctantly reach that conclusion. By then it was too late. Priorities had been established. Suddenly, reallocating the requisite resources of men and material devoted to the battle fleet to the submarine instead was impossible. Shipyards already were having trouble finding skilled workers, engineers, electricians, and metal workers being needed in so many places to support the war effort. The limits of yard space were also a problem as well as the recruiting and training of crews for additional boats. Submarines on the surface ran on diesel engines. Submerged, they ran on electricity. They were not true submersibles. They needed to surface to provide air for an oxygen-starved crew and to recharge the electric batteries for the power they needed to draw upon when subsurface. They had to strike by surprise. Yet, in the vastness of the ocean, it was difficult to find targets. The boats rode low in the water. They had no crow's nest. The torpedo was their primary weapon, complex, expensive, and bulky. They could carry only a limited number, and they were maddeningly temperamental. If they hit their target, would they explode or not? It was never a certainty. The deck gun was more reliable, and its ammunition was both cheap and compact. But it could only be fired when the boat was on surface and highly vulnerable with its thin skin and no armor. The gun was useful only against an unarmed, solitary merchant ship. Sinking merchant ships without warning was against international law, but the submarine had to strike by surprise. It could not stop, either to give any warning or to pick up any survivors. It had no room aboard for any extra people. The result was attacking on sight, waging unrestricted warfare. This caused huge losses of Allied shipping, and the British Admiralty secretly reported that by November 1917, Britain would be obliged to capitulate, but the sinkings in which a number of Americans died severely damaged the German cause and was a major reason for the intervention of the United States on the side of the Allies in April 1917.
The war's impact massively distorted existing patterns of shipping, disrupted markets, and altered routes with forced draft shipbuilding programs, but many existing ships sunk in action. The war shattered London's comfortable primacy as a transshipment center. The port had gained large profits from shipping charges, wharfage, warehousing, insurance, and all the activities relating to the handling, sorting, and reshipping of cargo. War ended that position. New York superseded London as the world's most significant seaport. Americans were those who ultimately profited most from these changes on the sea. The U.S. Navy challenged Britain's global supremacy. War's End found the U.S. with the world's second largest merchant marine. This was comparable to that of the 1850s at the end of the Age of Sail. The maturation of the Second Oceanic Revolution by 1914, with the internal combustion engine and oil replacing coal as the fuel of preference, left Americans as the ultimate benefiters, even though the British had been the pioneers of steam propulsion and electric transmission and had long held the advantage. In World War II, at sea, both sides again underestimated the importance of the submarine. Yet, it would have been the only way for Germany to win. The German surface fleet was of high quality, but small. Hitler disliked the sea as much as the Kaiser had loved it. But the U-boat had to compete for space in shipyards, supplies of steel and copper, and for skilled manpower. Nonetheless, the submarine may sea routes take on new and global significance in multiple arenas for combat, World War II being fought in the Pacific as well as in the Atlantic. The Germans had many more U-boats than at the beginning of World War I, although too few to assure Victory at sea. Karl Dönitz, the man most identified with the U-boat, argued, we need 300. He had only 57. And as in the previous war, for every boat on station, two would be at home for repairs or otherwise preparing for action. There were never enough. Dönitz credo was that sheer will could overcome any obstacle. His optimism appealed to Hitler, to whom he was absolutely loyal. Dönitz had no standard of morality. He saw his U-boat people as an elite, the gray sharks, so-called. They lived and worked in a challenging environment, severely crowded, with every space having multiple functions. The stench of diesel oil permeated everything, even the bread. The policy was to be unshaven at sea, the thicker the beard, the longer the voyage, and the greater the badge of service and sacrifice. There were no showers aboard, and perhaps one toilet for 50 people. All wore unwashed clothing and black underwear. Dock workers hated to board a U-boat upon its return to port. Das Boot, the book and the film, offers a vivid picture. You can only imagine the smell. For Britain, the North Atlantic was riskier than before because Nazi territorial conquests in 1940 meant that U-boats could operate out of France, where the Germans constructed hardened, bomb-resistant concrete pens. The Bay of Biscay was much closer to the theater of action, the Atlantic shuttle. Submarine technology was far superior to that of World War I. It adopted a Dutch invention, the snorkel, a device for taking in fresh air and expelling noxious fumes, 
while operating at periscope depth. The boat could use diesel power while doing so and also recharge the electric batteries needed when fully submerged. But it had to move slowly, lest the snorkel tubes snap. It was no miracle weapon, and on surface, the boat remained highly vulnerable. World War II also introduced aircraft to war at sea. In the Atlantic conflict, both sides used land-based planes for reconnaissance and bombing. The German Luftwaffe battered British shipyards and affected both production and repair. Allies used aircraft equipped with miniature radars to find U-boats and also had sound detectors, sonar, and the depth charge. Thus, the hunter could become the quarry, the hound, the hare. Imagine the terror aboard a U-boat under attack, lying at sea bottom, waiting, listening to the ping of the enemy's sonar, want waiting, knowing that it must ultimately resurface no matter what. <laughs> Allied convoys of 25 to 30 merchant ships with a circular screen of armed escorts, included ships carrying spotter aircraft, jeep carriers, so-called, able to find and destroy U-boats. Convoys were effective, but ship captains hated them. They had to be assembled, a lengthy process, and they traveled at a pace dictated by the slowest ship. Wartime shipping was essential for island nations like Britain and Japan. The U.S. responded with a shipbuilding program of mass production with standard types, notably the Liberty, half again as large as World War I freighters, welded, not riveted, with parts brought in for quick assembly on site. On the West Coast, Henry J. Kaiser turned to ships from building skyscrapers, dams, and bridges, Boulder, Hoover, Grand Coulee, Oakland Bay Bridge, and opened 16 yards. Labor shortages offered new opportunities for women. Rosie the Riveter becomes a popular icon. And when the high costs were questioned by Congress, Admiral Emery Scott Land chairman of the U.S. Maritime Commission said, if you want fast ships, fast shipbuilding, fast horses, or fast women, you pay through the nose. In both wars, Britain was absolutely dependent on the sea, and Japan ultimately so. War brings new economic and strategic dependencies, the cargo mix changes. Foodstuffs, as before, but also tanks and planes carried from U.S. factories to allies, including Russia, on the Murmansk run, which all mariners dreaded since so many would die. The Germans in World War II could draw on resources pillaged from occupied countries, but nonetheless had other needs. Oil was of prime importance to Europe. In addition, there were essential, yet not commonly available metals, such as manganese, chromite, tungsten, zinc, mercury, bauxite. Americans scoured the world for them. All had to be carried by sea, sometimes over great distances. Manganese from India, for instance. World War II on the Atlantic became a tonnage war, a struggle between the wolf pack, the submarine cluster, and the convoy, a race between the shipyard and the U-boat, the welder's torch versus the torpedo firing button. The great 20th century wars would furnish another illustration 
that logistics is a major key to success in warfare, and the sea had become the avenue for essential flows. The Japanese failed to use their submarines against merchant shipping, thinking that their role instead was to support the battle fleet. American subs employed unrestricted warfare with great success against Japanese merchant shipping, causing immense suffering, depriving Japan of vital imports of food and other resources. Air power at sea would be a third dimension of conflict flowering in World War II. After primitive beginnings in World War I, the U.S., Britain, and Japan would be the only navies that had developed naval aviation. The Royal Navy led but failed to resolve organizational responsibilities. The new Royal Air Force held naval aviation under its wing, and naval aircraft designs suffered as a result. British carrier planes were inferior to those of the others. The Washington Naval Disarmament Conference in 1921-22 inadvertently stimulated the aircraft carrier. Because of treaty stipulations, the hulls of intended battleships could not be completed and therefore were converted to carriers, larger than otherwise would have been the case. But no one, British, Japanese, or Americans, developed clear ideas about how to employ aircraft carriers. At Pearl Harbor, December 1941, using naval aircraft, the Japanese launched a war they could not win. It was a brilliant tactical victory, but proved to be a strategic catastrophe. The attack galvanized the U.S., immediately forging unity of sentiment for a hitherto divided nation, unwilling to go to war. The attack prompted all-out mobilization of gigantic resources that a technologically backward Japan could not possibly match. Japan's GNP was perhaps as small as 10% the size of the U.S. GNP. Yet Japan went to war with some assets. The Zero Carrier Fighter was light, fast, and nimble, the greatest fighting aircraft of World War II, manned by pilots, perhaps the best in the world. Japanese submarines performed poorly, but their long lance torpedo was the finest undersea weapon in the war. The tactical triumph of Pearl Harbor provided a striking illustration of Japanese naval capabilities. Six carriers launched 350 aircraft, severely disabling or destroying the U.S. Pacific battleship fleet of eight units. Fortuitously, the U.S. aircraft carriers were at sea, thus untouched by the disaster. Pearl Harbor shattered the role of the battleship as the core of naval power. Battleship culture had dominated naval thinking since Mahan touted it in 1890. Tsushima, 1905, Jutland, 1916, with a climatic clash of big guns, had seemed to justify it. Both Japanese and Americans anticipated a great surface battle as the decisive encounter determining the outcome of the war. Their war games were based upon it. In these exercises, carriers were given only a supporting role of reconnaissance, spotting, and scouting for battleships and the fleet. Pearl Harbor left the Americans with no alternative to organizing what would be dubbed the task force, a floating self-sufficient fleet of warships and service ships, with the carrier, the new capital ship, the prime offensive weapon, benefiting from rapidly improving aircraft. These were fleets able to cross the vast Pacific independently. The battleship thereafter was relegated by both sides to a supporting role, providing protection to the fleet underway, with its great guns used primarily 
for shore bombardment. The Japanese were slower to respond to the lesson than Americans. They did not recognize the great change until too late, after midway, June 1942, where they lost their main force of carriers. Today, the Carrier Task Force remains the central unit for the USN, whether this is appropriate or not. Cynics would say that it's thereby well equipped to defeat the Imperial Japanese Navy. Others would claim that it provides floating missile and airplane platforms that can be used wherever the world ocean allows against a wide range of enemy targets. The great French historian Fernand Braudel defines events in an apt phrase. Crests of foam that the tides of history carry on their back. Events are conspicuous but frothy and ephemeral, mere spindrift, we might say, beneath run less immediately perceptible tides and currents. Events like primaries, elections, even the fortunes of the Red Sox, are seemingly of cosmic importance momentarily, but they may cloud the less perceptible but greater submerged realities like revolutions, agricultural, industrial, oceanic. As we know, the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 16th marks the beginning of oceanic revolution. One word, range, defines this initial spasm. Atlantic Initiative opened the world ocean and reunited humanity, establishing a global presence and beginning a continuing process of global interactions. Globalization emerges, although no one then called it that. The 19th century experiences a second episode of oceanic revolution, thanks to exploiting fossil fuels and electricity. Leadership in the new technologies enables the Atlantic world to achieve global dominance, the global preeminence that no one region ever achieved before and which is unlikely ever to occur again. Penetration might be the operative word here. The Atlantic Oceanic Reach extends beyond blue water to brown and even by rivers into interior continental spaces. This is a time of Atlantic triumph and Asian decline, the exception being Japan, the non-Atlantic world staggering under both an intellectual and strategic challenge. The transportation and communications phenomenon created a new combination of threats, nowhere more than to the cultures of East Asia. Atlantic dominance lasted in effect through the first half of the 20th century. The ocean until 1939 remained virtually the sole means of intercontinental travel. Transit oceanic flights were just beginning in the mid-1930s and only for the rich and privileged. The Pacific came first, with flying boats that the pioneer airline Pan American called Clippers, which bridged the ocean but had to make frequent island stops for refueling. In the first half of the last century, ships carried ballooning quantities of freight, both raw resources and processed goods, and millions of people, immigrants, tourists, soldiers. For soldiers and immigrants, this was often the first, perhaps only, experience of the sea. Command of the sea lanes, enabling the tapping of global resources, as we know, was vital to the victory of the Grand Alliance, both against the Central Powers, 1914-1918, and the Axis, Germany, Italy, Japan, 1939-1945. As Dominion of the Seas would also be later for the United States in the Korean War, Vietnam, and most recently, the Persian Gulf. Two new dimensions opened, aerial and subsurface, both of great consequence in warfare, as we have seen. In World War II, 
the United States proclaimed that the first priority was the Atlantic, the war against the European Axis powers. But more and more, American resources went into the struggle against the Japanese in the Pacific, an ocean that was becoming more and more important to Americans and to the entire world. Changing uses of the sea bring us to a new phase of oceanic revolution, a new shaper of ordinary lives, including our own. Join us next time for episode 28, An Altered Seascape Emerges. Revolution at Sea is written and spoken by John Curtis Perry, with additional voicing by Jamie Rosenberg, recording by 1623 Studios and by Charlotte Allard in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Production and distribution by Albert Buichadé-Ferré. Goodbye until next time.